Okay, I'm addressing, I already said hello to the people who are here in this Zoom meeting. Now I'm saying to the people who are watching this recording, hello. Um, I am, uh, I'm presenting today on the first chapter of a book, online book that Leo showed me called Modern Statistics for Modern Biology. I wanna talk a little bit about my motivation for presenting on this. Um, if you're like me, maybe you have some, what I would generously call holes in your background knowledge about statistics or um, the sort of things people are talking about when they discover, dis discuss and discover um, findings in this field. Um, I, I find myself sometimes not knowing exactly what people are talking about. And I decided that I would like a foundational bedrock knowledge um, of specifically, particularly statistics in um, this, the field of bioinformatics. Um, this is going to be a very elementary presentation. My hope with this presentation and future ones is I, I would like to eventually work through this entire book um, and presentations, giving presentations at uh, Art Stats Club is an easy way to motivate myself to do so. Um, and so I probably in the future won't be doing every single chapter one by one because it's a book, it's 13 chapters. Um, and, you know, I did a test run of this chapter earlier and I, I would not be able to go into as much detail as I would like on um, in, in one hour. Um, but I hope to do, you know, like, like I might have said, every other chapter, if other people are interested in covering this book with me, you know, well, I'm welcome to work with other people and maybe we can like collaboratively read this, do this whole thing. Um, but if not, that's also fine. I'll just be hopefully in the future presenting on uh, future chapters uh, as a way to motivate myself to further learn about uh, um, bio, the, 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 the fundamentals of biostatistics. So without any further ado, let's talk about discrete data, everybody. Uh, discrete data, it's, it's um, in, in biology, there are, uh, there are times where we want to count discrete instances of uh, events occurring, such as um, DNA matching some sort of like reference panel. And um, this, we call these data discrete. Um, and this is in contrast, I think, um, at least in the book, this is how they explain it. This is in contrast to continuous data, continuous data being, um, you know, on a very simple level, uh, like day-to-day -day level, like weight, uh, mass, for example, but also like molecular mass or sequence length. Um, discrete data, we could probably, we probably understand it better as counts. Um, and so if we know the probability of of such counts occurring, we can actually like simulate and generate distributions of, um, we can generate distributions of these events. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about. Uh, and the, one of the most simple, one of the most simple ways to um, simulate such distributions uh, on a individual level is uh, called the Bernoulli trial. Again, some of you guys might already know this, but we're, you know, we're starting from the basics here. Bernoulli trials are basically like um, experiments where the outcome of the experiment is purely binary. It's success failure. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a size of one given uh, some sort of like pre-known, predetermined probability. Um, there are a lot of different uh, uh, distributions, uh, but the ones will be, there are a lot of different models uh, to generate these sort of distributions, but the ones we'll be talking about uh, today are Bernoulli binomial and um, and Poisson. I, I hope I said that. I'm saying it the French way. I'm not trying to be too French in saying it. I believe it's called Poisson. If you guys want to correct me, you're more than welcome. Um, so this is very. This is so. This is a mistake here. Um, Bernoulli trials are not also known as bi uh, binomial trials, uh, but mo many Bernoulli trials can constitute a binomial distribution. 
Um, and so you see the number of times um, the, the you you can see across you can see the number of times um, successes are measured versus failures across a number of diff excuse me a number of different um, Bernoulli trials. Um, so okay, so let me pull up the book so we can read along with the book. Um, yeah, I think I did an okay job explaining that. Um, so yes, you, another way of thinking of a binomial distribution is, uh, so a single Bernoulli trial would be like a coin flip. A binomial distribution would be a bajillion or even two coin flips. And there are functions in R that can do this for us. Uh, and one such function is uh, R binom. So um, here we are simulating 15 computationally fair coin flips and each Bernoulli trial, we'll get into more of this, more, we'll get more into this later, but each Bernoulli trial has a size of one. So we are testing each individual time once. Um, I'll probably have to go a little bit faster than this <laughs> to cover everything in this chapter. Um, you can see that we can sum the number of uh, successes um, and that is the same thing as setting the size of a single Bernoulli trial to 15. And you know, here we have a success rate of 10. Uh, this is sort of interchangeable, like size versus x, whatever this value is. Um, but we will figure out more on how to distinguish that a little bit later. Um, so, uh, uh, so here we can do the same thing. So 12 trials with a probability, two thirds probability of success. Um, and we're not gonna get the same result every single time, but um, this is another way of getting the same thing we just demonstrated. Um, one way that the book talks about imagining this is like a box where the ball falls into one compartment one third of the time, whereas it falls into the other compartment two thirds of the time. Um, very basic stuff. Uh, and I learned a lot. Um, so uh, we can get the number of counts by setting the size parameter, like I discussed. Um, and here, when we set the seed, we can fully reproducibly get the same value every single time. Um, this is, excuse me, I'm sorry about that. This is, uh, we are, we're getting the number five. So let's plot the number of times we get successes given n number of Bernoulli trials. So from zero successes to 15 successes, we're trying to calculate the proportion of times we get X number of successes. And here you can see I've already generated the bar plot. Um, most of the time, the plurality of the time we get, um, actually 22% of the time we get um, four successes uh, given a probability of 0.3, a 30% probability of um, success and uh, 15 Bernoulli trials. So this is how we can calculate the probability mass distribution or the number of times we can get uh, a success given n trials. Is everyone following me so far? Cool. Um, okay. So uh, this guy named um, I'm okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try to say his name in a way in an unpretentious way. Simeon Denis Poisson. That's the French way of saying it. I practice this. Um, the American way of saying it would be Simeon Poisson, um, and I'm offering both pronunciations, um, and you can pick whichever one you prefer to hear coming out of my mouth. Um, this guy uh, who uh, lived through the French Revolution um, determined that for uh, a number of trials uh, n large with a probability of success p small, um, another way of saying what I just said is when the probability of success is sufficiently small and the size of trials is sufficiently large, you can sort of approximate or generalize it with um, a formula, and this is called the Poisson distribution, um, where lambda equals number of trials times the probability. 
Um, and here I demonstrate using the R function. By the way, I'm completely averse. Like I said earlier, talking about gaping holes in my knowledge, I'm completely averse to mathematical notation. Um, so I kind of was able to prove to my, demonstrate to myself that these two functions are equivalent. Um, the probability, the binomial distribution function and the Poisson distribution function. Um, they produce the, literally the same exact graphic. Um, and here I, I code, I reproduce, I do what is, you can see here, um, and I calculate the Poisson distribution or the probability that the number of successes equals um, X, which is uh, this. Okay. So let's keep going. Um, here we want to simulate that. Um, so using, so I guess to, to generate, like have like a more concrete example of a probability distribution, we are going to determine the number of mutations that occur along a sequence length of 10,000. Um, so here using our binome, we can find that it's with a probability of five times 10 to the negative fourth in 10,000 positions, um, we get six mutations per 10,000. Okay, that's very cool. Um, let's do this. Here, we can simulate the, um, I have to think about this for one second. We can simulate the number of mutations that occur um, along the, uh, the number of mutations that occur along this certain given sequence length. Um, that's what I believe I'm looking at here. Although it's the I same forgot. sequence length, 10,000? Yeah, so no, no, no. So, so this is- 300,000 times. Yes, yes. I, I went over this earlier and I knew what I was talking about. And uh, this time I am trying to articulate myself in the same way. Um, we have a 10,000, uh, a sequence length of 10,000 and 300,000 such sequences. And we want to find the uh, probability, the number of mutations. And so um, here, crap, what the hell was I? So this is the probability of getting this number of mutations. So still we can see that four. Um, wins out. Um, that's the number of mutations if, I think we're getting. If you edit line 88 and after table, yeah, mutations divide by 300,000. Um, yeah, and just run that bar plot. Now you get uh, it. Um, okay, so that was giving us the, the raw number. Sorry, go on. Now you're getting the actual probabilities of getting, let's say, three mutations or four mutations. Mm -hmm. Um, so based on a probability of a single mutation of five to the 10 to the minus four mm -hmm. for a sequence of 10,000 base pairs, mm -hmm. you have a probability of around 0.14 or something of getting three mutations. Mm -hmm. So what was the y-axis before? The y-axis before was the actual frequency uh, uh, of, of the results of your experiment of doing it 300,000 uh, times. Yes. Yeah, so per so before, when it looked like this, this this was saying that for every like for every five thousand or so mutations, we can expect five thousand positions. What is that? Fifty thousand. Fifty thousand positions. We can expect four mutations. Fifty thousand uh, sequences of ten thousand base pairs. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Um, okay. Thank you, Leo. Uh, now that I think we talked about that enough and I get it, let's move on to um, use it, doing another real world example. Um, this time we are going to um, calculate, we are going to generate the probability of detecting um, an epitope, um, which is like the portion of an antigen that is capable of being bound by an antibody um, uh, 
we're going to find the number of epitopes. Um, and so let's begin. Cool. Um, so we, we are going to go into this experiment uh, with a number of, um, with three assumptions. We're going to get a false positive rate of 1%. Uh, the protein is going to be tested at 100 different positions. Uh, and we are going to examine a collection of 50 patient samples. Um, and so here we're going to verify that the, um, that the number of times we are going to find exactly one hit, given a probability of 0 .01, 0 0.01 or just 1% across 50 uh, patient samples is the same regardless of whether, basically we are going to demonstrate once again to ourselves the Poisson distribution function. There we go. So they're both about 30% of the time we can find one positive hit across 50 patient samples. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So uh, we're, gonna, we're going to load this uh, ELISA array, which is um, an ELISA, sorry, assay which is used to detect these epitopes. And we are going to find that on this, on this um, vector, on this vector, we have a single instance of seven hits at a certain position along the uh, antigen protein. Um, and so why, why is that? What, what, what are the odds? The question we wanna ask here, given this like, real world, supposedly real world data is what are the odds that there would be seven false positive counts on a single position? Um, and so, uh, yes, um, he, he uh, in this book, they kind of expressed this using the um, P Poisson function, um, wherein you, hold on. Let me find the exact parameters. So for people song, it's a vector of quantiles and you give it a vector of quantiles in Lambda. And so one minus this, one minus this value, 0 0.999, whatever, continuing, we are gonna get a very precise, we're gonna get a very precise value. And it's going to be this infinitesimally small number, which is sort of the, um, inverse granule, we'll talk about this later, but it's like the inverse granularity of through in which this experiment was conducted. Um, so this is the probability that the number of successes we're going to get is going to be equal to or less than six. But what if we want to find the probability of um, finding uh, hits greater than or equal to seven? You know, ever thought about that? Um, well, if you try to do it in the way that you think it would be done, you're wrong. Um, because we arrived at this value by looking at 100 positions and therefore the odds of arriving at, um, the odds of arriving at seven hits would actually be greater than this. Um, so let's get into what this book is calling extreme value analysis. So um, that is when you're attempting to find extremes in a distribution. Um, and basically the way they are saying you should do this is to generate the rank, rank what it calls the rank statistic, where you order the inputs, the um, this E100 vector from X1 to X100, uh, where X1 is the smallest value and X100 is the largest. Um, and the maximum value of, uh, of the maximum value is the, the maximum value being as large as seven is the complementary event of having all 100 counts be smaller than or equal to six. Okay. So they should, they should complement each other. If you know what I'm saying. Um, so this, now we, there's a lot of uh, math, but we don't have to know any of that because we can get the computer to do it for us. 
This is, it's calling the Monte Carlo method, a uh, computer simulation based on our generative model uh, that finds probability of events we're interested in. So um, he, here we're going to replicate, what is that number? A hundred thousand times the maximum Poisson value um, given this lambda in this number of um, trials. So let's see. Um, uh, number of random variables. So that's the number of random variables. We're going to simulate the same thing. So two is the biggest of what we just um, what we just simulated. And so across a hundred thousand times, we are going to find what the biggest value is going to be. At one time, we found the biggest value being the maximum number of hits being nine. Go ahead, Leo. So can anyone tell me in this why uh, um, that is not actually the maximum of the previous simulation of this output? Not Arta, but anyone else. Just trying to promote more. Oh, because. Oh, I don't. I don't. I, I know you. You know the answer, Arthur. But I, I'm curious if anyone else knows why. Silence. So the code that Arthur wrote is correct. The thing that changes is that every time you run the function R, R, R police. Um, you're actually simulating data again. So these are two different um, simulations uh, or random Poisson numbers. So in the first case, I think the maximum is actually four over here. But in the second case, like we simulated and we're not actually seeing these 100 observations or 100 random numbers. Um, in that second case, uh, the maximum was two. Um, but in, you know. Yes, uh, that was my mistake. And yes, in the third case, the maximum was nine. So I actually simulated this thing three times, but I wonder if I can set seed, oops, one, two, three, four. Let's see what happens if I can get the same thing every time, yes. So if you set the seed, I guess going back to something that everyone knows, computers are very bad at generating truly random numbers. So what it does is it uses like a seed that you can use to reproducibly generate what is a pseudo random number. Uh, so if we set a particular seed, we can see that we get 11 times seven is the highest value in this simulated um, ELISA assay. Uh, is that correct, Leo? Okay, cool. So we run it a bajillion times and um, let's see, let's find the, um, let's find the mean. So this is the percent times, or this is like the probability of times we get, sorry, not percent, but probability that we get this, um, this value. Uh, and if we scroll up, we can see that they, they validated this using a proof um, here. I mean, they got a different value than me, but because they, I mean, I don't know what their seed was, but here you can see that they validated this. They went through all the steps. Um, oh no, this is the incorrect one. Where's the correct one? Okay, well, they, um, okay. So then they talk about, this guy references the OJ case, which is pretty cool. Um, but anyway, they prove using fancy math. Here we go. Here, he gets the same value as, okay, whatever. I'm gonna stop trying to find what he does. So anyway, more or less agrees with his, agrees with his theoretical calculation. And so this is what I was talking about, um, granularity, granularity, granularity. So. Um, uh, 
we see we already see one of the potential limitations of Monte Carlo simulations. The granularity of the simulation result is determined by the inverse of the number of simulations. So the number of times it, this is like going back to I think later or earlier he talks about power, but this is like how much of a refined, precise um, probability, whatever probability you're trying to generate is always going to be limited by um, the number of simulations that you've run. Um, yeah, so the, the smallest non-zero probability you can com compute with 100,000 is going to be 1 divided by 100,000, right? That's, that's correct. Uh, the smallest non-zero one. Yes. yes. Um, so, I mean, you can do it like a million times, 10 million times, 100 million times, et cetera, be one more digits. Mm -hmm. But the more the more times you do it, the more compute power you need. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, thank you, Leo. Um, so to reiterate, uh, this type of probability, this this type of modeling where you're 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 generating distributions, it's you it's used when all the parameters are known and you are creating values in a top-down um, fashion. So uh, what I talked about, the presentation that I did back in like December about tidy models where I used machine learning models to um, figure out what the reality of the distribution of values was in the real world, that is more bottom up because you have, you are training a model on values you've collected, and then you're trying to replicate the model which exists in nature using a computer. Um, that is, I guess, the difference between top down and bottom up. Um, bottom up uh, modeling. So um, now we're going to move on. How much time do we have? We have 30 minutes. Okay, I I can I can I can take it a little bit slower. So now we're going to get into multinomial distributions. Earlier, when I didn't mention multinomial distributions, I was lying. We are going to talk about that. Um, so there are instances, I'm sure you can imagine, and you've done this in your research, where there are more than two possible outcomes. Um, here, we will, using the, we will be using one of the simplest um, examples we can use in genomics, which is the four nucleotide bases. Um, uh, so we can think about figuring out like what, again, this person's talking about balls. I think we're a little bit more sophisticated in our understanding of, I mean, I mean, I won't, I, I don't know. I'm sure you guys are. The balls kind of helped me a little bit, but you know, you don't have to think about balls, whether you want to think about the balls falling into different compartments is up to you. Um, but that's one way you can think of it is dropping balls into like different sized compartments. Um, uh, if you're like me. And so this person does a bunch of math. I don't remember any of this. I don't even know if I ever learned mathematical notation to begin with, going back to the chasms of knowledge um, in my past. But um, we can simulate such a distribution of uh, Wait, what is this? Okay. D multi no. Suppose we have here. Oh, okay, here we go. So here we are simulating four boxes. Um, we are simulating what the probability is of discovering uh, getting two balls in one compartment. Sorry, two balls in one compartment, four in another, given that they are all perfectly equally likely. So what is what is the probability we are going to get this exact arrangement of um, this exact arrangement. And this is the value that we came up with. This is the value that we have. So it's 0 0.0036. Um, so that's kind of, okay. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on here. We often run into some sense it is a strong man. We'll see more examples of chapter three or a few other commands to generate such a vector of counts. Eight characters of four different equally likely types. And so given, um, per, wow, okay, <laughs> right off the bat, I mean, I don't think you were gonna get this every single time, but the given, given this probability vector, 
which is perfectly equal across four different um, four different uh, types, and each have a one fourth probability of getting a hit. Um, and with a size of eight, this is like this that generated a multinomial distribution. If we do this again, right? Yeah, the odds of us getting like a perfectly even. I guess that's what we're getting into. What are the odds of us getting a perfectly even versus not getting a perfectly even distribution, multinomial distribution given um, probability vector? So here we talk about power. You guys know about power. It is the probability of detecting something if it is there, the true positive rate. Um, so this is pretty juicy. I like this part. Uh, here we are simulating uh, if in a sequence of 20 nucleotides, we can get a distrib, we are reliably getting a distribution of nucleotides that are about even, which is what we expect. We also call this the null hypothesis. You guys already know the whole, the whole deal. Um, the null hypothesis is that we cannot, we cannot assume that there is any sort of deviation from what we would expect. There is no sort of like, there is nothing happening there, quote unquote. There is like an even distribution. You can't make a claim one way or the other. So let's go. Let's let's see, baby. Um, this guy talks a lot. So 1,000 simulations from the null hypothesis. Um, let's do 1,000 sim simulations from the null hypothesis. Um, so this is a sequence of 20 um, bases, the 20 positions. And we're going to simulate 1,000 times how many times on this sequence of 20 positions we are getting what we would expect, which would be um, an even, which would be 5, 5, 5, 5. Or I guess maybe we are simulating, we are, we are trying to determine if what we are getting is significantly different from the null hypothesis, which would be uh, perfectly even five, five, five across the four, um, across the four different nucleotides in a twenty sequence, in a twenty position sequence across one thousand samples. Is everyone following me so far? Are we good? Okay. All right. Um, all right. So let's get into it. What is this? What does this do? So um, this is calculating the error. This is deviation from the expected value. Um, this person creates this, this formula to find the sum of squares, which is the um, a measure of deviance from the expected value. Um, this person, the authors of this book encoded it into a function and they got 1.2, we got 1.6. So for one, all 1,000 instances, let's let's compute it and store it into a vector. And so the mean sum of squares is about three. Um, and we can plot, we can plot this. And what we are getting is um, the, uh, what we are getting, okay, yes. We are, what we are getting is the uh, distribution of sum of squares across all 1000 samples of 20 position sequences. So let's do this. Let's find out. So the summary function shows us that that the sum of squares takes on a spread of different values. From the simulated data, we can approximate, for instance, the 95% quantile, or a value that separates the smaller 95% of values from the largest 5% values. Um, this is, this is the result. So I'm getting 7.6. They also got 7.6. Leo, can you help me out? Can you tell me what I'm, what this is, like what I'm looking at? I guess this is the value. That, that tells you that 95% of um, the times uh, you get a mean, uh, what was it, like the deviation? You get a mm -hmm. deviation that is less than or equal to 7.6. Right. Okay. So, Thank you. So you can use that to try to find extreme cases, mm -hmm. right? So anything above 7.6, you would consider an extreme scenario mm -hmm. where like your data is deviating 
um, significantly from from the null model. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that point, you could be like, hey, like, um, I got a, a weird distribution. I mean, a, a weird set of, um, a weird sample, right? A, a weird uh, number of balls per the four compartments. Okay. Um, and so then you could be like, hey, like something here is um, abnormal, right? Mm -hmm. Not expected by chance mm -hmm. at, a, at a 95% confidence. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. These are all concepts that I am like familiar with working in this field, but I have never formally learned. And so this is the 95% confidence interval. Um, and so, and yes, any value. It's not, it's not a confidence interval because then you would, you would need actually to, um, to have both the minimum and the maximum, right? It's just telling you okay. that the 95% quantile here. So okay. dividing the 95, the lower 95% versus the higher 95%. Okay. Okay. So it's sorry versus the high 5%. Right. Right. So this is similar to, I guess what I'm trying to express is this is similar to things I've heard of before. Um, so uh, now we're going to simulate something else. Um, so we generate that 1,000 simulated instances from an alternative process parameter, parameter, parameterized by PVEC A. So this is a different distribution. This is not the null distribution of um, probabilities. And so this is what we observe in nature and not what we would expect. Uh, we have the dimensions of the, um, the distribution. And um, we have this matrix here. And it shows us uh, the number of, this is strange. Okay. Okay, it shows us this. I guess, I guess the way it's being depicted in my console is, yes, it's omitting three rows, correct. So it shows us that um, given this probability distribution or given given this, this set of probabilities, probability vector, um, across 1,000 samples, each sample containing um, 20 possessions in the sequence, um, we, we have generated these different distributions of nucleotide base pairs. And um, here was, when I, when I ran this at first, I, my values were a bit confused. What I expected to get was a bit, I, I was not able to get what I expected. Um, so here we are multiplying. Yes, we are getting we are getting the number of times per um, sequence we can expect to get each nucleotide. Um, so seven point five 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 two point five, um, and we want to ask how often out of one thousand instances will our test detect that we have departed from the null distribution. And so this is, again, a new standard error. And um, we are, this is, we are finding the average number of times this standard error is greater than the 95th, 95th um, percent quantile. So um, anyway, this is this is about where I got a bit lost, and then I did not have enough time before this presentation to cover um, to cover uh, or to go over this. But um, and I remember when I was first attempting to do this, I was not getting what I expected. But um, let's see what I. Okay, so I'm sorry. I don't remember what I did here. I think I was trying to figure something out, and um, and I have diminished my. But I wrote this note that I've diminished my ability to detect deviation from the null hypothesis, and I don't quite remember why I said that. Um, but uh, I don't know, Leo. Do you do you think we should go into it? Like, do you, do you? Would you be able to um, 
sorry. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, this is uh, where I got lost in this chapter, but uh, um, that's basically what I was able to get from multidomial distributions. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I guess I can work through this while you guys are here. So um, if you just go focus on the book instead of your code. Okay, sure, sure, right. sure. That makes more sense. All right. So, so here, like, uh, if you scroll up a bit, right? So we're defining a new vector of probabilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's no longer the fair case with, where each of the four boxes has the same probability. Now it's a bit different. This first okay. box has three eights. Um, uh, and then the third box has a little bit less, right? Um, mm -hmm. Actually, three twelve says um, one fourth also. Mm -hmm. um, um, the fourth one is the one that has a bit less, mm -hmm. one eighth. So you have those probabilities. And uh, with our multinum, we're going to use that vector of probabilities, right, with 20, um, 20 balls and find where those balls land. Um, and we're going to do this a thousand times. So that's this first argument on, um, on our multinum. And so that's why we get a matrix that has four rows because we have four different bo uh, boxes. Mm -hmm. and a thousand columns because we have a thousand different uh, samples that we regenerated. So here they're just showing the first seven columns. So that means the first seven samples. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so <clears throat> uh, overall, we see that the mean, right, is like uh, 7.469, almost five, oh, a little bit over five, a little bit under 2.5 here, right? Mm -hmm. Um, right. And that's the mean across our thousand samples. Mm -hmm. the expected uh, probability though is you multiply your probability vector by the number of balls that you're getting. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's why our expected probability here is seven point five 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 and two point five mm -hmm. right? early n. And so we can compare that like across the one thousand samples that we have. It's fairly similar to to the expected. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's still differences, right? And so um, um, this function stat that they wrote, right? Mm -hmm. um, that um, asks, uh, can you scroll up to where you define stat on the on the sure book? Here we yeah, go. So here, All right? So that function has an observed and an expected. Um, 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 and what it does is that it, for every one, it computes the difference between the observer and expected, takes it to the square, divides it by the expected value, right? So that's how, how we are getting that deviation, right? So now you scroll down to where we were. Um, so, um, yeah, so we're saving um, that information, the deviations on that S1 uh, object, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing here is I don't see is where they define the Q95 object. Uh, I, it was, it was, sorry, it's, it's here. Go ahead. Um, and SO. This is where they, they did it with um, uh, the data according to the null hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. So um, in a null hypothesis with like completely even, um, uh, that 95% quantile was um, 7.6. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're comparing like an alternative versus a null hypothesis type of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we scroll now down to, um, to what we have. Um, uh, we, um, we computed the deviations, right? So that's our, the deviations in our, in our, uh, honor this, um, 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 like skewed, uh, or not even, uh, distribution, right? Mm -hmm. And we can compare that against the 95% uh, quantile, 
mm -hmm. um, from the null hypothesis, right? So here they're asking how many times uh, do we get more extreme values than what was of zero under that null hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. So that's 199 out of a thousand, right? Mm -hmm. a thousand. Oh, I see. Um, and so if we actually want the power, right? Mm -hmm. Is the probability that we're detecting mm -hmm. um, uh, um, um, what was it detecting true cases, right? Mm -hmm. um, you you defined it earlier. Um, oh, I'm sorry. What are you what are you talking? Are you talking about S one? Um, no power. The definition of power. You had it a, a little bit earlier. Oh sure. Yeah yeah the yeah the ability to detect um, true positives, the true positive rate. Yeah. Um, um, so here we're actually going to compute this other probability, which is the probability that we're rejecting the, the null hypothesis on the alternative. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way we can compute that is by using the uh, simply like dividing the number of cases that we found by the number of um, simulations that we ran, right? Mm -hmm. we, we ran a thousand, so 199 divided by a thousand gives us 0.1999. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm sorry, two nines. Um, and so right now we have a, a, like a, a power of around 20%. Mm -hmm. This formula right. there is the same as power, right? Mm -hmm. um, just define like uh, in statistical terms. Right. Um, so this can be useful because, uh, I mean, a power of 20% is fairly low, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but let's say you might be asked to do a power and analysis of like, are we going to be able to detect like, um, um, a, a difference in this type of magnitude, right? So like for a magnitude of, um, of um, a probability vector that is what is it creates one fourth, one fourth, one eighth, right? Right, right. We will have the power to um, a power of um, basically 0.2 if we only generate 20 um, data for 20 observations, right? So 20 balls. Mm -hmm. We might actually need more balls if we want to increase the power. Right, right. Um, I see. Um, um, or to look at larger differences in probabilities. Right. Uh, so, um, so here they're trying to like explain like a bit like what happens behind when we do like a power analysis, mm -hmm. um, but using the multinomial distribution. Mm -hmm. um, um, but like, for example, Josh is working on some RNA seq power analysis. Mm -hmm. that is like instead of using the multinomial distribution at that point, we're using T distribution. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's a bit more complicated because you're looking at many genes, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, I have a question. So for line 207, when we're actually doing those observations, does like the, the thousand observations, that, that doesn't impact power then? Is that correct? It's going to impact the number of, of decimals that we we can measure power on, right? So right now we're only doing so that's that's the granularity that uh, Arthur was talking about. With a thousand, we can only the the smallest thing we can detect that is non-zero is one over a thousand, right? Um, so the smallest power we could detect would be like zero point zero zero one, right? And the maximum power we can detect that is not one it would be like 999 over a thousand. Okay. Um, normally we only care about power like um, um, like on two digits, right? Um, so like having a thousand is I guess um, pretty like okay because you can round the third digit, right? To get um, to get a, a two-digit um, number, um, have enough precision for that. Uh, but like if we were trying to compute a, an actual probability, we might need to use more than a thousand, right? Um, to have like smaller decimals. 
Um, but like we power, you know, power we're trying to get like around, you know, 0.8, right, normally. Mm. Uh, uh, we're not trying to compute like a small p value of like, you know, 0. 0.00001 or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can always do it with more. It just takes more time or more resources to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to do this task here and I wasn't, I mean, I, I don't know if it's worth getting into right now, but that's probably what I was, I think that's what I was trying to do and I wasn't getting the values I had expected. Um, and that's why um, I just sort of got, got lost yeah this was this was observed b yeah this was a different these were different size 2000 um, yeah, so this here is there. size 20 yeah you can see that i was experimenting here and then i just kind of like can you open the task so we can see what it was on the on the book side yeah uh well no this is this is it this is it the task is saying try to get an acceptable power of 0.8 by altering the n. So that's what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And because um, the original was 20 and I just kept getting lost and I was getting um, like a lower power. That's what was happening. I, was, I kept getting a lower power and I didn't know why. And I was like thoroughly checking the names right. of my objects to make sure um, there wasn't any mistake there, but I, I, I wasn't getting anywhere. So I just sort of gave up and then I forgot to go back to it. Yeah, where do you have stat E? Um, yeah, let me, here it is. So I just removed the default definition for expected, which was- Oh, uh, you don't actually need to do that, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I know, but I was, I was just like going cuckoo. Mm -hmm. I was like, what is the problem here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, like if you go to the book side, uh, just scroll up a little bit more. If you wanted to compute something with more power, like um, like get more power, don't go don't don't go that up. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Where do you want me to go? Um, scroll down to where we define uh, um, uh, key back a. Yeah. So here you define an observe, right? Right. Um, you might need to do a second observed object, but instead of size twenty, like use. Yeah, like the size 2000 or something that you're using. Um, yeah. Then after yeah. that, you scroll down on the book side. Um, uh, you don't need to define a new expected A because that would already have that. Um, uh -huh. Expected doesn't change. You will need to define a new S1, right? Where right. there you're applying um, the observed um, and you're applying the stat function. Mm -hmm. um, now I see why you're saying that um, you made a stat B function because that has some defaults that um, uh, that use use other objects. So you would need like to add like a little comma here and say, like provide the actual, the actual like expected times um, times two thousand. Mm. Um, so the the apply uh, function call would be a little bit more complicated than what you have here in the book. Mm -hmm. um, um, so it might have been better if the book actually showed like here how you're specifying the, the, the rest of the arguments for the stat function, uh, even if they're the same as the default ones. Mm. Uh, that would have made it easier for the task for you to recognize like why you need to change. I see. Right. Um, well, so I don't know if you have anything else, otherwise we can stop the recording. Um, no, I think I think you can. I think you can start reporting.